Hello, I'm your host, Kyrie Douglas, and welcome to Catalyzing Computing, the official podcast of the Computing Community Consortium. The Computing Community Consortium, or CCC for short, is a programmatic committee of the Computing Research Association. The mission of the CCC is to catalyze the computing research community and enable the pursuit of innovative, high-impact research. We are joined today by CCC Council Member Suresh Vengata Subramanian. Suresh is a professor at the University of Utah. His background is in algorithms and computational geometry, as well as data mining and machine learning. His current research interests lie in algorithmic fairness and, more generally, the problem of understanding and explaining the results of black box decision procedures. Suresh received a career award from the NSF for his work in the geometry of probability, as well as a Test of Time award at ICDE 2017 for his work in privacy. He joined the CCC Council this year. This is part two of my interview with Suresh. If you haven't heard part one and would like to, click the link below or, depending on how you're listening to this, above. How did you first get involved with uh, CRA and with the CCC? Like, have you been going to CRA events for a long time? or No, I haven't. But I've been always, I've always sort of watched them from afar, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so you see all the postings, you see the Talby surveys, Most. the CRA put together that postdoc program that actually got, I had a postdoc who is now a faculty member at Utah who, uh, through the CRA program, uh, the, the, the CI fellows. Yes, the CI fellows program. Yeah. Thank you. So, so I, I've known about what the CRA does for a long time. Uh, I've always felt like they really represent the re- computing research community in a very effective way, and they speak with this voice that is very powerful. So I've only uh, so I've only known them from afar. You know, I've heard about the CCC. I never quite fully understood what it does, even though I was a practicing researcher. I didn't quite know what the CCC does. But then once I learned more about it, I said, "Oh, this is a good group, and it'd be nice to get involved with them somehow." So, yeah. hmm. could you maybe pitch the CCC a little bit now that you've been a member for? I guess six months. I don't know how long. It's less than that. Less than six months. So um, yeah, the, the very informed opinion of a person who's <laughs> been here for less than six months. Oh, Mark doesn't kill me for this. So, okay. <laughs> um, what does the CCC do? Okay, so what we try to do is keep an eye out or even more than keep an eye out, sort of try to encourage new trends, new directions in computing and link up the people who are doing the work with ways that they can actually make this work happen and actually have an impact on the world from the work they're doing. So this is very vague, right? So what I, what I mean by that, right? And so think about, say, efforts in quantum or efforts in this new workshop in thermodynamic computing, right? Uh, quantum is an older discipline. Thermodynamic computing is a new idea. So you have a new idea. You have, you're, you're a professor. You have this new sort of idea. You're seeing some interest from your community bubbling up to the bottom. The first thing you might think of doing is, okay, I'll organize a workshop at a conference, try to pitch it. And maybe that'll work. But you'll get people who tend to go to that conference. You won't get people who don't go to that conference right. already. So if you have an idea that probably needs people from different disciplines or different walks of life to come together, you're not going to do it at a workshop at a conference. They're just like, what is this conference? Why should I go there? So you need some kind of way to get people together. So that's the first thing the CCC helps you with, right? You can pitch workshop ideas. They can, they can give you the resources, the administrative support, the money to get groups of people together. And, and then once you do that, you have your ideas. You want to sort of, now, okay, you've got the workshop. You've got the people talking to each other, but now you've got to write papers on this. You've got to get some support for this. The CCC also does a very good job in trying to pitch these ideas to agencies who might be interested in funding such work, right? Not at the narrow level of funding one particular topic, but as part of a larger, broader picture, right? You might be doing this workshop. Someone else might be doing another one. You might not know each other, but the CCC does. And they can integrate all these different strands of efforts into one coherent whole to pitch to funding agencies and others to say, hey, you know, this is something that's coming up from the from the community. Let's try to support it. So the CCC, I see is a major facilitator, right? Sort of a, a catalyst, yeah. if you wish, right? To to make these things happen. And the, these things don't happen by magic, right? This is one thing I've learned. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of backroom effort, a lot of efforts from people who don't normally get seen to make your ideas of a research program become a reality. And having seen how that sausage gets made, you can see the role that entities like the CCC have in actually making a research agenda come to fruition and making it a viable, you know, ongoing concern. If you are a researcher and you want to build a new program, you have ideas, you have a group of people, come to the CCC and talk to us. And it's our job to see if we can make it happen for you. It's not our job to censor you and tell you what to do. It's our job to listen and see if we can help you make this research agenda happen, because that's what our job is. I do think one of the fun things about working at the CCC is getting to interact with these different communities. Yep. Um, in the spring, we held a workshop uh, on socio-technical interventions for health disparities. Uh-huh. Um, and we co-located it with the Society of Behavioral Medicine Conference in New Orleans, which was great because then we could bring in researchers in 
computer science and health informatics with all the behavioral medicine people that were already there because right. um, they had to be there for their other conference. Uh, right. So those kind of things are a great way if you're interested in getting involved with the CCC and you know of a meeting that you could bring computer scientists to or bring social scientists to uh, a computer science meeting, you know. Right. And I will say, I mean, a lot of the reaction to, from research is like, oh, my God, that's so much work. I got to write this next paper. I can't really afford to spend the time organizing this workshop. And that's another thing the CCC helps a lot with, right? And just the, the logistics of actually putting such an event together and the finances and just getting, getting everyone organized and sending out the invites. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of help the CCC provides to organizations who want to do this. It's effort, yes, but it's a lot less effort than it would be if you do every single thing yourself, including getting yeah. funding for it. See, one thing we have to realize as researchers, and it's very hard to realize this, is that we think that ideas are the currency because we were all about the ideas. But ideas are, at some level, not that hard to come by. What's hard to come by is to, is to connect. <laughs> because connection takes time and it takes resources. And if you can have an, something that can help you make those connections to build something, that's where you need entities like the CCC to do this for you. Hmm. So the CCC has a number of task forces that focus on different areas. Yeah. Um, for instance, cybersecurity and cybercrime, health and human intera computer interaction. Uh, you're involved with the Fairness and Accountability Task Force. Yep. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what you guys have done so far this year, what you plan to do going forward? Done so far this year, such pressure, you know. <laughs> you sound like my department, you know. <laughs> 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 the main thing we don't know. Okay. So, I mean, so, uh, so first of all, I should emphasize, uh, this is not a new task force. This has been around for, from earlier. And I don't remember all the names of the folks who were on this. I know Cynthia Dwork and Sampath Kanan were in the, involved in this before and, and Liz Bradley was in it as well. So there was, a, it was a privacy and fairness task force. And now has sort of, we're focusing mostly on fairness. It's a group of people on the CCC who are more focused on a particular topic because there's this belief among the council that this is a topic that's worth monitoring. And so the Fairness and Accountability Trust Force recognizes the increasing importance of thinking about the way algorithms are deployed in society, in decision-making and decision-assisting scenarios, and worrying about issues of whether these algorithms are fair, unbiased, whether we have accountability and transparency for how they're used, and all the issues surrounding it. For example, you know, one of the things we're planning to do is organize a workshop on fairness and economics. Fairness is one of these topics where, depending on how you look, people have been thinking about this for 2,000 years, right? So go back to Aristotle, go back to earlier. Um, you look at theories of justice, you look at the political science world, the sociologists, economists, lawyers, philosophers, everyone has weighed in in some way on what it means for a society to be fair, what it means to conduct, to conduct yourself ethically, to what it means to do what's right, uh, to treat people well. We are the latest sort of newcomers in the, in the game. So it's very important that we bring these communities together to understand everyone's perspective, to understand what we've learned about what works, what doesn't work, and how these perspectives are, are similar, how maybe we're reinventing the wheel and how that wheel is maybe is maybe not the same wheel as before. Maybe it's a motorbike tire, but it's still wheel-like. And uh, so this example of a workshop on you know, bringing economists and people and researchers and fairness together is great because now we'll get uh, this whole different perspective on how to think about incentives and mechanisms to build in to achieve fairer decision-making with algorithms. And that's one of the cool things the CCC does, I think, help bring these communities together. So I think it's worth mentioning for people listening that might not know, most CCC events are by invitation only. But of course, if you hear this podcast or find out on the web and you're interested in an event, you can certainly reach out to one of us and get an invitation. I um, should also mention that the Fairness and Accountability Task Force held a workshop this spring on uh, fair representations and fair interactive learning which uh, recently released a report titled The Frontiers of Fairness in Machine Learning. So that's available on the website and on archive for people that are interested in learning more. And that's a great report that Aaron and Alex uh, did. I mean, it's a really good. If people want to understand what's happening in the field right now, it's a great report to go look at. So I guess we mentioned a little bit, uh, but we don't want to get too political, but in recent times, since especially the 2016 election, there's been sort of a lot of discussion around whether the world is sort of 1984 Big Brother with new technology or kind of uh, Huxley, Brave New World. Do you have a viewpoint on which of those you think we're going? Is that perhaps too pessimistic? Should we be more optimistic and less depressed? I definitely think we're more Huxley than uh, Orwell. For me, the difference is to what extent we are aware of the situation we're in. One of the diabolical things about 1984 was the idea that that thought was a crime, right? That 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 merely thinking bad thoughts could be punished or should be punished in some way. 
And so there was a lot of effort to suppress and quell your bad thoughts. But you get to Huxley and you get to a brave new world and you don't even realize that those thoughts have been banished. You're not even aware anymore of the class you've been put into, whether you're an epsilon or an alpha. You don't question. That, to me, is a compelling metaphor for the way social media and the sort of our mediated world is kind of filtering out without our realizing it, uh, what we see and what we don't see. Optimism, I think, means we, we believe there is a better way. In that sense, yes, I'm optimistic. But it's not pessimistic to realize that we're in a pretty bad place. Because if you don't do that, you won't start thinking about how to fix it. Right. <laughs> so you do have to recognize the problems you're in. I think these problems are tricky. I think they go back to deep-rooted notions of how people operate in society, right? We're, we're, we're fundamentally tribal in many ways. And the way in which technology amplifies the worst parts of our nature, along with better parts of our nature as well, right? I mean, you think of Wikipedia. I could not think of a better way to illustrate how people can work together to come up with something that's just so amazing. But then you also have, you know, 4chan. <laughs> You know, I'm running the risk of getting it myself docs, but anyway. So, um, <laughs> but but you but you but it, it's everything. It's it's everything we are magnified by a thousand. I I don't I don't know what we do about this. These are our own instincts coming to stare us in the face. We are we are sort of gaping into our own souls <laughs> and not liking what we see there. Right. But it's now it's blaring in our face as opposed to a whisper in our ear that it used to be. And I think that's the problem to the extent that I'm part of the people who are building these tools. It worries me even more. Do you have any thoughts on how? Potentially algorithms could help solve these problems or a direction that you've seen looks promising? I think we have to think more creatively. We have this idea that, oh, we have a problem, we will fix it with an algorithm, or, oh, we have a problem, the algorithm made it worse. And this binary is not helpful. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been part of this binary for a bit, but it's not helpful. It's not helpful because it it assumes that there are only two, there are only all we can think about is whether the algorithm replaces us or not. One thing that I think personally at HCI has become an important, a much more important part of computer science as a whole is that I think there at some level is some recognition that there must be better ways for us to interact with our devices, with interact with machine, interact with technology. And we're still thinking of, okay, we'll have tech do this for us or do that for us. I'm still waiting for the world where it's a seamless assistant, not Siri or Alexa, but a seamless assistant that helps us without telling us what to do or without filtering us or, or being paternalistic in the way we see a lot of tech doing working right now. So when we say, you know, how can tech solve problems, it still feels very paternalistic to me, right? Okay, we'll use tech to solve problems. We can't solve ourselves. I think, how do we use technology to bring out the better part of our nature, <laughs> right? Clearly we can. There are places where we've been able to do this. The entire web, maybe pre-commercialization, is an example of technology bringing out the better parts of us, right? But we have to think more creatively about how we do that. And I think we're not quite there yet. We're still in phase one of how, we, how technology in, uh, collides with society. We need to get to phase two. So an example of a thing that I know you had mentioned seems like it might have some problems is facial recognition technology and, oh, yeah. and mm. biometric data. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? So what is the, what is the problem? Or well, what is the issue here? Right? We now have software to identify quickly where a face might be in an image. And we have further software that can attempt to identify who the person is by looking up a database of images and saying, okay, this person, this face in this live image or this live video stream looks like this person's you know, mugshot or this person's picture that we've taken from some other source. And so the idea is, you know, there are many reasons why people want to use this now, but the most obvious one is surveillance. So now you have this technology sitting on your street, on your cameras, and it can constantly monitor people and track them, you know, in a kind of minority report-ish kind of way or, you know, other way like that. The problem, I think, right now at least, is that these tools are packaged without context. In other words, here is a facial recognition box. Throw the box whenever you need facial recognition and we're done. Mm -hmm. I think one thing we saw with, you know, some of the problems with the tool that Amazon released that the ACLU of North Cal Northern California looked at was that if you deploy this black box in a situation without the right sort of framing around it, then all kinds of things happen you don't expect. And so one of the larger questions around technology that shows up here is that we think of technology pieces like black boxes. You just throw them in and then magic happens. Add sugar to your cereal and suddenly it's sweet. It doesn't work that way because there's a much larger context. The context in which you insert a technology is as important as the tech itself. And if you don't understand the larger context and how the tech's going to be used, um, you're going to have problems. And there's a whole field of study, science, technology, and society that talks about all these issues. So the problem with facial recognition, I think, is a microcosm of this general idea that we'll build some tech and throw it in somewhere. We'll sell it. You know, so our responsibility is over. We'll sell it to someone and how they use it is their problem. And that's not, that's not how this works. Right. We cannot ignore that 
we have chosen to package up facial recognition as a single black box when actually you have to look at the larger context in which it's being used. So what kind of context have it been used so far? It's been used in pilots for the most part for now, right? In, test pi in pilots. And there was this sort of well-known example of, of one such system being used to monitor uh, people attending, I think, a football game, a soccer mm. game in England. And the error rate on that tool was very high. It was something like a false positive rate of 96%. Oh, wow. Yeah, of, of people hitting a database. And then the question was, well, yes, there's a false positive rate, but we'll have people looking at this to check to see. But with that high false positive rate, you've got to wonder what's going on. Um, there's been some incomplete information about whether this was being used in Orlando or not in the police department as a test or not. Again, it's very hard to get information uh -huh. about these things. And a lot of these things are happening in secret, which itself is a big problem. There's no reason why this should happen. The, the public needs sort of to know what, whether this is going on. So the, again, it's mostly used in sort of surveillance. And, you know, uh, one of these body cam companies is, wants to use basically monitoring of body cameras to identify whether uh, an encounter is likely to become a threatening encounter or not. One of the things they might use that is facial recognition. So most of these so far have been sort of security-related applications. Um, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah. But you could imagine, I guess, if it becomes more common, maybe companies have facial recognition technology that knows when you come to work as opposed to... Punching a time card, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So I guess the question with all these things is why? Why do you... So so you're a company. You say, okay, we'll use face recognition to see if someone showed up or not. Why would you do that? <laughs> you know, when Apple builds in face ID on their phones and all, it's like, oh, it's easy. You just look at your phone. It's great. And I think that that rhetoric, of, oh, it's just easier to do this is very tantalizing. It's like, oh, yeah, I don't have to worry about my badge. I just show my face to the screen. But... There are consequences to this, you know, as uh, as one study showed, right? If if you if you have different skin color, and the face recognition system is not trained properly, it will not recognize your skin. So now suddenly you're standing in front of the door to your office, and you can't get in. You have to show your face there five times before it lets you in. Now that's not just an inconvenience. That's a statement that you are different. Right. Just because the system is not smart enough to recognize what you look at, that's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's not easier. It's easier for someone, but it's not easier for you for sure. There was a time I remember when you, know, when you go through immigration now, you scan the camera. Mm. In the beginning, they had the system. I used to have the hardest time getting my face scanned through it. Really? I don't know why. I'm not saying it was because of my skin color or anything, but it was very hard. And now it's gotten a lot better. But it's just, it's embarrassing. It's, yeah. it's sort of, it's awkward. It, and so who is who are you making this better for? When you put, it sounds like cool whiz-bang technology, but what exactly is it doing to help people? And I think we don't ask that question enough, right? <laughs> I mean, who are you helping with this, right? By putting the system in place. And if you are, are you really helping everyone? Are you helping the same people you've always helped and ignoring all the people you've always ignored? And how is this making the world a better place? Right. So you also helped start the ACM FAT conference, which I believe stands for Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency. Yeah. Um, There's a star at the end. It's a sort of a computer science joke, right? So it's a regular expression. So it, any, fairness, accountability, and transparency in any area. Okay. Not just, say, in machine learning or mm -hmm. in, this, in any area, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you started that? So I was one of many people. Uh, I'm not, you know, I was one of the, a, a large group of people who started the conference. Mm -hmm. So I want to give everyone credit for that. Um, so what we were, so we, we'd been, you know, so there was this workshop that was being organized at um, the machine learning conference, the, uh, the, the main machine learning venue, NIPS. So a couple of folks there put together this thing, again, recognizing that there's this growing interest. It started like I think 2014, this growing interest in thinking about the way we deploy machine learning in society. And so we had that workshop for a number of years and you could see the demand just sort of skyrocketing for, for research in this area. And this led us to believe we need to have a much larger venue, a conference, if you wish, where people can come and talk about this. And one of the things we've, we sort of recognized early on is that this has to be an interdisciplinary conference. This cannot be just a computer science thing because a lot of the questions coming up, a lot of the ways to understand the questions coming up don't come from just the technology. They come from outside. We tried to bake this idea of an interdisciplinary venue from day one into the conference. And so we have multiple tracks. We have, you know, people from, like I said, sociology, from the law, from economics, from philosophy coming in and giving presentations at last year's conference. That's the vision for the conference. And it's, 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 it's a hard vision because... Communities are naturally siloed. And again, this goes back to what the CCC does, right? I mean, communities tend to be very siloed and you need ways to sort of connect up communities together, which is what the CCC does sort of among the things it does, it does very well. And so one of the things we've been trying to do with the conference is make sure we can get people from different communities to find value in this conference that are willing to show up and attend and actually talk to each other about their work. 
And so that's the vision. So we're in our second year of the conference now, and we're hoping to keep it going for as long as we can. As long when as is can. the next c conference? It's going to be January 29th through 31st in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And if people want to get involved, is there a, what's the process? Um, we've got we, we've got a huge number of people registered already, but go to the website fatconference.org, and um, maybe you'll still be able to register at this point. It's uh, it's 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 uh, it's a busy time. Yeah. Okay. We're glad, but it's also kind of you know we're, we're oversubscribed. Yeah. Yes, but definitely check it out. And for anyone who's interested in maybe trying to start a similar kind of conference, I guess what would you recommend? What were tips to sort of? So we have some already. Ideas. There's the conference on AI ethics and society that AAAI runs. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is another venue. Good way to start up is to say, oh, in my community, I really want people to start thinking about these issues. Maybe I can organize a satellite workshop at my community's main conference or main venue where people show up. You should reach out to us and we can give you some advice. We can help you. I mean, I'm helping organize a one-day event, hopefully in, in, in Hong Kong sometime earlier next year. Having both disciplinary uh, workshops and also area workshops, I think the issues of, of fairness and accountability in India are very different to what they might be in the US, mm -hmm. very different to what they might be in Europe, to well, different parts of Africa and South America. And I think that's another good way to think about this, right? How do these issues play out in your part of the world? Because it involves law, it involves society and culture, and that varies a lot across the, across the globe. And I don't think the US has the, has the monopoly on how to think about these issues. Yeah. So, then, so think about it from, an, from a discipline point of view and from an area point of view, and come and talk to us and we can help you, give you advice, suggest people you might want to bring in, and we can definitely help with sure. that. And we talked before about needing, I guess, resources to get this kind of thing going. Were you able to get resources directly from ACM, or how did you get the funding? So we've got organizational show? resources from the ACM. We have a lot of funding support. Um, I, if I try to list all our funding support right now, I'll probably forget half of them, and I'll get into trouble. Uh, but the um, but the Omidyar Foundation has definitely supported us. Um, we've got money from the ethics and governance of AI fund. And we've got a lot of other, a lot of companies are interested in sort of helping out because they, again, recognize some of the problems here. So um, so we are, we are able to get, it takes work um, and we've got a great group of people who are actively going out trying to solicit support for us while keeping our sort of the research process independent is always well, also an important thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it, yeah. So we've been able to get support for, for doing some of this. So, um, so we've covered a lot today. Uh, I don't really have any more detailed questions, but is there anything we didn't cover you want to talk about or anything else you want to pitch, plug? I think if you are, so if you are an early stage researcher, let's say you've just joined a faculty somewhere, congratulations if you have, and you're overwhelmed by everything, you should keep an eye out for what the CC is doing, not because we're asking you to get involved right now, although if you want to, that's great, but you should keep an eye out for things that are happening because these are signs of trends that are bubbling up the community that you might want to get involved with. If you're someone who has sort of a more stable research pipeline, you're coming up for tenure, or you're seeing that you know, you're confident in what you're doing and you want to see what the next directions are, you should definitely, definitely talk to folks in the CCC. Maybe someone at your university is on the council. You know, the CC tries to make sure that uh, no more than one person in the council from any university, so we are trying to spread out. So talk to someone who from the you know your university or someone you meet at a conference and see if you can pitch some ideas yourself, if you have ideas for things you want to do to broaden the work you're doing. And um, and if you're you know if you're well established, then you know all the more reason you should be coming and talking to us. You should know about us already. And if you don't, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Suresh, for being here. It was a great conversation. I hope everyone listening enjoyed it. If you want to learn more about the CCC, you can find us at our website, cra.org slash CCC. And tune in for more podcasts where we'll be interviewing other members of the CCC Council and workshop organizers and participants. So check us out. <laughs>